Imagine waking up tomorrow and all of the external information you rely on so heavily had disappeared. All of the tools, pens, paper, computers, books, diaries, photo albums and videos. Even Google had disappeared. All of the external memory you relied on was gone. Would your world crumble? Well at one point in time, this was reality. Every thought was just a thought and there was nothing to do with it apart from remember it. Any stories to be told, any transfer of information and ideas would first have to be remembered. Sometimes as humans we are often forgetting experiences quicker than we are actually living them. Take reading for example. We read, read, read and forget, forget, forget. So if that's the case then what's the point? In this day and age we tend to read more extensively than intensively. There is so much choice. I have my own personal library of over 200 books. Can I remember them all? Of course not. Reading this many books is extensive. In the past people may have had access to only a limited number of resources. So read more intensively. Take the Bible for instance. Was this a better strategy? Well, they say a book scribed in the heart's wax is better than a thousand in the stacks. Just reading is not necessarily learning. So how does learning take place and how can we remember more? If I can only remember so much as the last book I've read, then what's the point? Sometimes I forget why I opened the fridge door. If I can better remember, then surely I can become a better dad, partner, son and contribute more to others. When my kids ask me, Daddy, what was I like when I was a baby? What was my first word? How old was I when I could walk? How was I on my first day of school? All of what should be my personal secret treasures and all I can say is well... That's a good question. Why don't we ask your mum? If I can't memorise basic life events, how did chess grandmasters memorise the positions of thousands of pieces? How do mental athletes or MAs memorise thousands of digits within the hour? Or 10 decks of playing cards within an hour? How do they memorise one deck of cards in two minutes? And why do I have to write everything down? Ok, so I did grow up in the age of a rotary dial telephone. And I still know my grandparents phone number and all of our home phone numbers we had growing up. Which, with contacts in mobiles, is a thing of the past. If you tried to remember the following letters C I N A R M B E R E T M E You might have a pretty hard time But those letters are a combination of the sentence I can't remember All of a sudden it becomes a doddle They have literally been chunked together to make it easier to remember You will indeed be able to name all of the letters very easily that is the essence of learning, attaching new information to something you already know. If you try to remember the digits 3114203660, it will be quite difficult until you give them meaning and attach them to things you already know, such as You're 31 years old. You live at the house number 142. You were born in March, the month 03. And you can run a mile in 6 minutes. Now it becomes much easier. There is a 2005 year old technique, probably older, called the memory palace. It was used to memorise speeches, poetry and names. As external memory has become greater, has this technique been lost in history? The warriors of the mind argue that the repetition, drill and kill we use today is an ineffective remembering technique and the art is in the memory palace method. What we are doing with memory today, they argue, is the same as taking an Olympic athlete, sitting them down, giving them 20 cigarettes a day and putting them on a junk food diet. Then asking why they didn't win gold. But if the world record for remembering single digits stands around 83,000, then there must be more to remembering than simple repetition. It took this guy nearly 17 hours to recite the digits for heaven's sake. There would have to be a more efficient way to remember. But if I said to you, you could memorise 83,000 digits right now, would you believe me? Well in fact you already have. 
All you have to do is count to 83,000. You could in fact count much higher. Said like this, it doesn't seem as impressive, but the fact that they are random digits makes it all the more interesting. Our memories are not built for modern life. The tasks that we rely on memory for today were simply not relevant in the environment in which our brains evolved. Tasks such as where to find food, how to get back to shelter, and what foods are edible and unedible were more common. Today we simply tap numbers and letters into a GPS and get directed there. But our brains are exceptional at remembering visual imagery, but not other types of information. And this 2005 year old technique takes advantage of that. The first step is to create your memory palaces. These palaces do not need to be palaces, they can be anything from your childhood home, your route to work, an 18 hole golf course or a shopping centre. Anywhere you know really well, where you can go in your mind and visualise vividly. Let's say for instance you would like to remember a shopping list. Go back to your childhood home and in your mind place a tomato on the driveway where the car should be. Be creative, play with the colour and size. Make it into a giant tomato, feel the texture and taste it. Go closer to the tomato and try and pick it up. What would a giant tomato feel like? What sound would it make when you dropped it? Continue through your front door and continue to strategically place these vivid images in your memory palace. Okay, so what's the point of going to all this effort to remember a shopping list? Well, if you like tomatoes on toast in the morning, it's well worth it. But isn't it easier to write it down? Of course it is. That's the whole point. It's not easy. But what about if you wanted to remember a presentation at work? Would it not be more efficient to use images that remind you of key points of the presentation? And wouldn't it be more efficient than repetition? If an 18 year old kid can remember 83,000 random digits, of course it's a great technique. So what about remembering words or names? It is thought that if you are told that a person's surname is Baker, rather than if you were told that he was an actual Baker, you are more likely to forget the surname and remember the occupation. But why? It is thought that the occupational term Baker triggers an image and thus easier to recall. That's the secret to remembering names, creating images. If you are trying to remember the name Robert Kerr, you might try to imagine a robot stroking a cat, purring or curring. Sounds crazy, but you are so much more likely to remember the image and hence trigger the name. When I first picked up the book, I had questions like, what is memory? How are they formed? Why do we forget some and not others? So why do we forget? The beauty of being human is forgetting. It allows us to filter out unnecessary information so we can easier make sense of things. It is in fact what allows us to learn. It is thought that only one hour after learning something we've forgotten two thirds of it. In our brains we have 100 billion neurons that are capable of between 5 to 10,000 connections per neuron. When a memory is made it is said that a single connection is made. Each time this memory is triggered it is thought to strengthen this connection. This is what long term memory looks like. Even today modern neuroscience is baffled by how memory can be stored like this. But long term memory is not the only tool available to us. We have what's called working memory. If the information is not transferred to long term memory, then it's forgotten or filtered away. This is where the rule 7 plus or minus 2 comes into play. It is thought that our working memory is capable of storing or thinking about 7 things at the same time, plus or minus 2. Without going back, try to remember the first 3 words of the previous sentence. If you couldn't remember, that's because your working memory has dropped those words to avoid information overload. Our brains tend to look at the whole picture. In a conversation it doesn't remember the exact words, rather the meaning of those words and the feelings they produce. Have you ever been in a bad mood and no matter what your partner says to you, you perceive them as unhelpful? It wasn't the words that were unhelpful, it was the meaning you derived from those words. Perhaps some time later you swear that the words that were actually spoke were different from what your partner remembers. It wasn't the words, it was how your brain filtered those words and attached meaning to them. 
Sometimes what people say isn't perceived the way they meant it to be. Welcome to the beauty of communication. Our brains try to see the bigger picture and filter out unnecessary information. And that's my interpretation of Joshua Foer's book, Moonwalking with Einstein. The art and science of remembering everything. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel so that you are sure to hear about the next video. Thanks for watching.